if you've been watching my videos then you'll know that I'm in the process of repairing a number of REN executive computer systems and as part of that I need to check and possibly repair the floppy drives that are part of those systems. There are two in each system and I've got three systems I'm working on so I've got a total of six drives to look at. I've briefly tested all of them in the machines um, as far as I've got with the machines and I know for a fact that at least one isn't working. The rest seem to work but two of them have mechanical issues. I suspect it's just a case of cleaning the uh, various mechanical parts. They're just making a lot of noise and uh, juddering when they're trying to move the head and drive the uh, stepper. So if you're interested these drives are type uh, F051D made by a company called Tunon and um, one of the things I found with these, I can't find any detailed uh, technical documentation for these uh, and also what I have found is that they do vary quite a lot. The actual mechanism seems to be fairly consistent but the uh, control board that's fitted to them does seem to vary a lot. I've seen at least four different uh, versions of the control board. So as ever, kind of flying blind here, but these drives are relatively straightforward to uh, repair. Uh, and the way I go about the initial testing is I'll inspect them, look for any uh, mechanical corrosion, dirt, give them a good clean, uh, and then lubricate them, then drive them for a while, come back, re-clean and re-lubricate, and then I will finally uh, adjust the alignment, that's the mechanical alignment, and then I will adjust the gain. I've got some alignment discs and a disc exerciser which I'll show in a separate video uh, which I use for that process but in this video I want to look at the basic testing to show what I do and then we'll repair the faulty one. So the first thing to do is I've got this connected to a Cryoflux disc reader system so this will allow me to do some very basic control uh, but also some raw uh, data reads from the drive itself. So first thing to do when you're working on drives is make sure you have them correctly configured so you make sure that if it's uh, the second of two drives in the machine you'll possibly have to change the, the termination resistor network and also change a jumper to set it to drive one. Uh, the Cryoflux will handle multiple drives but I tend to just test them one at a time so I always test them as uh, drive, uh, actually drive zero. So first thing I do is, before I try to drive it using Cryoflux, is make sure that the head uh, is free to move uh, and then just pull it away from the home position. Obviously be careful not to damage anything. Uh, and when we power this up, if it's working at all, then the onboard processor should initialize and drive the head back to the home position. And we should be able to see that. Uh, and also the drive motor, um, which we can see on the underside, might spin briefly but it should stop after a second or two. So I'll power this up and as we can see this drive has homed and the drive motor is not continually spinning so it's a good uh, first step. Next thing to do before we put a floppy disk into the drive is to try and calibrate it using the cryoflux system so this will just drive the um, the head out to the maximum extent that we've told Cryoflux this drive can handle. In this case it's track 39, these are 40 track devices so the tracks are numbered 0 through 39 so it should drive out to track 39 and then back and that went as expected as well. So next thing to do is if you're fairly confident that there's no physical damage and it's not going to destroy your disc is run a test, test uh, disc through it. So I've got a test disc I use here. And then we'll try and read the disc and see how it goes. And this will just step through all the um, various tracks and sectors and see if it works. So uh, it's capable of um, driving um, but what I need to do is tell it to drive all the way up to the final uh, track. So we'll set it to 39 and then now this time it should run through all of them if it's capable of doing that. So 
data we can see it's coming up with the expected data this is modified data I've got in here to fully test the drive so it should come up with an H and towards the end I've got some intentionally um, dubious CLC values so it should start detecting uh, possible CLC errors uh, but hopefully correcting them and the target RPM is 300 and it's showing 299 Oh, it's very slightly over 299 which is fine and so this is our expected bad sector and you'll see what it should do is go back try again and that's to make sure the system is capable of detecting errors what I don't want to do is to go through thinking it's reading something and it's coming back with um, garbage data that's fooling the system into thinking it's reading properly so what I normally do is set the last track with some um, wrong CRCs in the headers. Uh, that's on my test disk, of course. Uh, what I then do is I put a normal disk in and we should then be able to read it successfully, but that's as far as I go for initial testing on the drives. Uh, the next thing I'll do is give them a full service and then I'll do a final full read with a known good disk that has good data all the way through. So that's this disk initially tested. We'll now move on to the, uh, sorry, the next uh, drive tested. So we'll now move on to the next drive. And uh, I know this next drive doesn't work. So we'll have a look at it and see if we can figure out what the problem with it is. Okay, so I've got the next drive plugged in. I'll try powering it up. And as uh, previously, we should see the head initialize if it's working at all. As we can see, it's doing nothing at all. Seems to be completely dead. Uh, the motor isn't uh, doing what it's supposed to. It's spinning continuously. So there's something uh, obviously amiss there. I do have the termination resistor fitted and the uh, jumpers in the right place, but uh, this is kind of typical of the sorts of faults you can get with floppy drives. That's why you don't put a disc in to start with because it might also be putting current through the read-write head. Um, we'll try to calibrate it and see what it does, uh, but I suspect it's going to come back with a uh, an error because I doubt it's actually talking to the controller at all. So the lights on the front is flashing, that's not surprising, that's driven through the control cable, uh, but sure enough we're getting an error saying it can't communicate. So what we have to do is start looking at the uh, control side of things and we know that none of the motors are working uh, the LED is working so we can be fairly confident there's some power coming to this and to save a bit of time I have checked the power and uh, I know that's fine uh, so we'll get the scope and if you're not familiar with these types of drives let's grab one of the working units if we look at this you'll see that it's got AD8048C uh, controller. These are very similar to the controller on the tape drive of the Fluke that we looked at fairly recently. Same family, same sort of thing, it's an embedded uh, microcontroller. Uh, one thing that's a bit odd with this drive is it's almost impossible to read the text on it, uh, so I suspect it's either overheated or somebody's um, uh, been playing with this and uh, warmed the, the text off it. Um, but what we do to start with is see if the uh, clock is present on this unit. Um, sure enough that's fine, should be 6 MHz. And it is. Uh, and then what we want to do is look to see if it's initialised the read-write amplifier. And we can do that by looking at the raw data out. Which is fine. So we know that the analog side of the drive seems to be working and um, we can now look to see if that data is getting through this uh, control buffer. So if we go down to the next pin, then this should just be gating that data on and off. So when I try to read the drive, what we are seeing is the control signal from the controller uh, through the ribbon cable. Uh, but because nothing else is happening, then I suspect we have a problem with the controller. So if we look at, 
Incidentally, when you're working on these drives, they appear to have weird uh, part numbers um, on some drives. Some are fairly e easy to identify, but some have got just weird um, OEM type numbers on them. But they are, for the most part, standard uh, TTL devices. So uh, if you just look at the uh, pinouts for them, figure out what's going on, or you might even be able to find a data sheet for the particular OEM number and you'll find that, um, the, for example, this one's got a weird number on it, but it's actually 7400. Uh, zero, zero. Uh, and this one's a, a 107. So once you know the uh, expected pins, then you can uh, obviously just treat it as a uh, standard TTL logic uh, circuit. And we can see we're getting the control signal there. Uh, but because nothing else is happening, I suspect the processor is dead. So we can check that by seeing if we're getting any activity on the data bus and ports and there is nothing at all and it's getting fairly hot so I suspect the controller has failed. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll um, power it all off and we'll look at getting the board out and swapping the microcontroller for one that works. Okay so first thing to do is pull the two plugs out, there's one for the motors and there's one for the read right head. And then there are just three screws that hold this in, but almost certainly they're way over tightened, so you might find it takes quite a bit of force to get them out. And then we should be able to carefully remove the board. Okay, so as you can see, it's uh, almost impossible to read the text on this, so I'm not quite sure what's uh, been going on there. Uh, but I'll go and get this uh, out of the board, and uh, we'll look at finding a replacement for it. Okay, so I've got the chip out of the board. Um, these boards are fairly easy to work on, of course. There's um, quite large uh, holes for the pins and they're reasonably stable tracks. They don't peel off too easily, but if you are working on them, um, trying to overheat them because uh, as with all old uh, boards, uh, they're not quite as resilient as the later ones. So that's the device off the board. I will fit a socket um, when I refit the replacement. But the question is what to replace the device with. So these are mask ROMs, so the code is put into them at the time of manufacture. They contain a program that's used to control the floppy drive. And I do have uh, a copy of the binary file for this, uh, but even if I could find um, mask ROMs like this, then you can't program them. The program is part of the manufacturing cycle. And as I said, these are, if you look at the ones you can read, these are 8048Cs, and you can get 8748s, which are uh, basically EEPROM versions of this. And they come in uh, various forms. You can get uh, one-time programmable, which look the same as this, no window, but you only get one chance to program them. Uh, so what I tend to do is use the windowed version first. So this is an 8748 and because it's windowed, if I make a mistake programming the first time, I can erase it and try again. And what I normally do is I will go through that process until I've got it working, and then I will uh, burn uh, an OTP version and use that as the permanent uh, fix. Uh, so what I'll do now is I'll get this programmed with the uh, binary file. I'll fit a socket to the board, and then we can refit the board to the uh, drive fit the chip and see if it all works. Okay, I fitted a socket to the board. I've programmed a replacement device. So we'll get the board refitted to the floppy drive, get the uh, replacement controller fitted and see if it all works. So first thing we need to do is get the board slotted into place, making sure that the LED passes through the hole in the front panel. OK, 
okay and now we can fit the replacement controller okay and if all's gone well then this should now power up and the head should drive to the home position once power is applied so I'll do that before I connect it to the controller so we'll just plug the power in I'll power up the supply okay and it's driven back to the home position which is a good sign I'll power it back off and now I'll get the uh, cryoflux back in and we'll try actually driving it to see if we can read a floppy disk okay so the control system is initialized and what I should be able to do now is calibrate the drive again this should drive it out to the maximum extent which it does it's a bit noisy it uh, obviously needs lubrication so uh, I won't drive it for too long but we will try just quickly reading um, a disk and we'll make sure that we have the uh, drive settings correct so that it will drive right the way out to the last track Okay, so I'll put the floppy disk in and we'll try to read it. So you can hear that it's making a lot of noise, but uh, they tend to do this when they haven't been used for a while. It doesn't need to be properly lubricated in service, but I wanted to repair it first just to make sure it was uh, feasible to get it working and um, just initially do some testing to see if it was worth uh, spending the time and effort on to replace the parts but it seems to be reading the disc quite reliably and it's gone all the way back okay so this is um, now almost certainly a working drive uh, but what I'll do as I say I'll give it a full service but um, that's now repaired and working I'll most likely program uh, an OTP controller so that I can replace the window type. These are a bit expensive so it's better to use the OTP and also the OTPs are less likely to cause any issues in the future. And um, that's another one repaired. Uh, any questions or if you want me to go over any more of this uh, setup or, or service in detail then leave a comment.